Okay, great. Um, I'm looking forward to the to the next uh, talk. We've got um, James Purden is coming to, uh, now to speak from Open Humanities Press, um, and this is an interesting project that you may or may not know about, but it's certainly a, a new way of uh, approaching the whole um, endeavour of publishing. So we've, we've, we've spoken to a traditional, or heard from a, a traditional publisher, and now we're sort of looking at a completely different perspective. Yeah. So this is uh, James Purden. Great. Okay. Let's see. This is the problem when you publish on technology. Technology sort of eludes you. Um, can I be heard? Is that... Is that working? Brilliant. Okay, um, I'll pass this around. This is an example of what we've actually done, so people can actually see it. Um, so I'm, uh, my day job is uh, I'm a lecturer in English at the University of St Andrews. Uh, I was previously here. I did my PhD uh, at Emmanuel College. I finished that in 2012, and for three years I was a research fellow at Jesus. Uh, so it's nice to nice to be back. So I'm I am an early career researcher. Uh, my PhD was picked up as a book by Oxford Univers University Press, and that was published at the beginning of last year. Uh, I'm currently editing uh, a book, the first volume of a new series called British Literature in Transition for Cambridge University Press. Uh, and I've also been a peer reviewer for, uh, for journals like Modernism and Modernity, um, and for publishers, uh, not CUP I think, but for, for OUP. Uh, for Routledge uh, and a few others. So I, I think I have, I wouldn't claim to have a kind of panoptic view of the publishing landscape, but I, I think I've seen into a, f a few of its corners, at least from the perspective of um, an editor, which is what I am. Uh, so the project I'm going to talk to you about today um, is called Technographies. It's a series that we've been running through Open Humanities Press, uh, which is a fully open access publisher. You can go online and download all of our books in a PDF format. I'll give you the URL at the end of my talk. Um, you can also buy this book through, these books through print on demand. They cost uh, in the region of, I think they're £10 sterling, or um, for, they're also on sale in the US uh, through Amazon and so on. Uh, other publishers are available. Um, and I think the cost there is about $12. So they're not expensive. Uh, and they're also free if you're happy with a digital copy. Um, we started doing this project in 2014. My uh, then PhD supervisor, uh, that former, just former PhD supervisor, David Trotter, um, in the Department of English here, and Stephen Connor, and other of the professors in the Department of English, and I got together um, to see if we could do something that would enable us to look forward to some of the requirements for open access that are increasingly coming through um, through government uh, uh, research assessment frameworks and audits. Uh, this is actually a, a, one of those rare instances, I think, where my own inclinations and, and I think to some extent the inclinations of my subject actually kind of converge with some of the top-down um, uh, requirements that are coming from government, certainly within English and probably within some of the other humanities subjects represented here today, there is a kind of push towards opening up access, towards breaking some of the stranglehold on publication that has been um, held by some of the traditional publishers, with all due respect to them. I'm a, a happy author for a couple of them. Um, and through some of the journals particularly um, uh, that are, are aggregated among some of the large publishing companies. Um, so we wanted to do this partly um, because of this sort of thing. Uh, this is the uh, policy framework for UK higher education uh, as it currently stands. Uh, looking forward to the next REF in 2021, I think it will be now. Certain things rather hazy, certain things um, clear. The policy framework as it stands at the moment, this is the key bit for me. The core of the policy is that journal articles and conference proceedings must be available in an open access form to be eligible for the next REF. In practice, this means that these outputs must be uploaded to an institutional or subject repository. This doesn't, of course, apply to books yet or to book chapters, um, but there's no telling what might be coming in the pipeline. And I think it's certainly the case uh, that in government policy and increasingly in institutional policy, there is a push towards everything going further towards open access. I know certain universities 
um, UCL, I was looking at their framework the other day, also require that books are uploaded to their institutional repositories. So uh, it's not, it may officially at the moment be something to think about in terms of journal articles, but I think as we move forward, there is increasingly a push towards thinking about all content that's being produced in our universities as fitting into this open access framework. There are a number of ways in which people can address this, these requirements. One is, uh, again, institutional subject repositories. Um, my own university, St Andrews, has one called Pure. Uh, Cambridge, I believe, has one, although I can't remember what the current name for it is. Apollo, Apollo right, there we go. Um, so institutional and subject repositories are perhaps the most obvious one that you'll encounter as if you're an early career researcher or a, or a mid-career researcher. There are the, the for-profit <coughs> sites like academia.edu, which I think rightly there's been a little bit of a, a backlash against because it's, again, although presenting itself as open access, um, is not entirely uh, open and is certainly monetizing some of your research uh, still. Um, there are other projects like Humanities Commons uh, and uh, SOC Archive, I don't know how to pronounce that with the X in the middle of it, but which I think we're going to hear a little bit more about later today. Um, increasingly, my colleagues and friends use personal websites to upload some of their material. Um, Stephen Connor, another of my co-editors in this series, has been doing that for a very long time and is... Uh, in that, as in many other ways, ahead of the curve. That's also a good way of doing these things. And uh, the last way that we decided to, to take was to go with uh, an open access publishing framework. <coughs> um, now, there are a lot of uh, open access publishing frameworks, publishing companies. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the advantages to them, the drawbacks, and then about why we specifically chose to go with Open Humanities Press and how we found that experience. Um, one, as I've just mentioned, is the opportunity to prepare for open access requirements. Uh, that's fairly obvious. It kind of goes um, without saying. Uh, secondly, when we produce the volumes in the Technographies series, we have a relatively quick lead time. We can do the, uh, the, the desk decision stage, if you like, deciding whether we're interested uh, in a volume relatively quickly and get an answer back to an author, a kind of preliminary yes or maybe we're interested or, or no within a couple of weeks, right, or however long it takes us to lead that. Um, and then in terms of production, once it goes through the process of peer review, which we still engage in, um, and uh, the editorial process, which because we're um, perhaps not as resourced in that respect as some of the traditional publishers is the longest um, part of the process, uh, we can probably get a book from manuscript to press within six to eight months, I would have thought. Um, bearing in mind we've done two so far, uh, and those both took about six months, and we have a third uh, on the way. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, the structures for this apart from editorial, are uh, fortunately, at least in my subject, in English, um, are already in place. People are, are used to doing peer review. Um, there's a lot of goodwill, uh, which is already being taken advantage of uh, to some extent by traditional publishers. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but th one then begins to think, well, if the traditional publishers and journals are taking advantage of that goodwill, can we direct it into... into um, producing a kind of genuinely open access um, landscape of, of academic publishing. Um, and finally, it's really flexible. So one of the things that we're looking at at the moment is the question of um, whether we might be able to publish non-traditional formats. So one of our current uh, areas of investigation is, for instance, the 20,000 word uh, long essay or short book. Uh, fully refable, um, fully print on demand, so you can have a copy of it, uh, also downloadable online, but breaking the kind of the, the hegemony of the 150,000, 160,000 word monograph as the kind of standard entry point for academic publishing. Um, shorter forms, perhaps, that one can get out quickly. Uh, when we went into the project, we were looking at all sorts of possibilities for 
um, online publication, uh, dynamically updated um, websites, uh, online content, video content and so on, all of those are possible. Uh, we went down what we thought of as, I think, a kind of middle ground between uh, traditional publishing, and I'll go into the reasons for doing that, and um, something that would give us an opportunity to make a difference and, and move towards uh, an open access framework. There are some questions and some challenges, uh, which I think can also be helpful for us to address uh, as, as the, the landscape of publishing ch is changing so quickly. I think for me, the most significant of those questions or challenges is about prestige. How do we produce uh, a new academic publishing framework uh, that carries uh, the same kind of prestige as publishing through traditional publishers? Um, and that's especially an issue or a question for early career researchers who want to make a splash with that first book, who want a first book to be coming from a reputable publisher, from a reputable press, partly because increasingly in the academic job market, having a first book from an, a reputable publisher um, is a kind of a, a significant a kind of sine qua non of, of getting that first academic job. So I think that's really important. Um, for us, there are a number of ways we address that. One of the great things about Open Humanities Publishing, uh, Open Humanities Press rather, is that it has uh, a very prestigious, very well established and very diverse editorial board at the top of the organisation. Um, you can go to their website, check that out. Uh, and also each series um, the Open Humanities Press commissions has to assemble an editorial board of its own. So we have a number of, um, of academics from various career stages, um, international uh, and very well respected in their fields, who are uh, on hand both for peer reviewing when that's necessary, when subject, when manuscripts come in in their fields, uh, and also just to take an interest and in general direct um, the direction of the series. Um, so that's one way. Another, of course, is paying attention to the, the details of, um, of proofing, of first of all, of peer review, secondly, of the kind of structure of the book, the construction of the book, the, the, the aesthetics of the book, but also the, the, the meat and potatoes of um, proofing of um, editorial work uh, that gets done at uh, every stage. Um, so those are the editorial processes. Um, uh, one of the challenges for editorial processes, as I've suggested uh, for us, has been we're not resourced with a big editorial department. When I published through Oxford University Press, I had a great experience with OUP USA, um, but I, I was working with um, one member of a very large editorial department. It went, for me, very smoothly. Um, but I always felt and still do feel that there was a, a very well-resourced editorial department there um, working 9 to 5 on it. Uh, for our uh, work at Open hum with technographies at Open Humanities Press, the editorial department at present is us. So every book that we produce goes through a process of editorial that's being done by us as academics through, we have a house style guide, um, it will go through multiple proofing revisions and, and checks um, among the editorial board. Um, but one thing that we're certainly looking at in future is trying to establish the resources in order to put in place uh, some more full-time, um, uh, not employees necessarily, but, but uh, contributors to that editorial process. Editors, if you will. Um, <laughs> Another challenge, I think an important one, is the question of interfacing with traditional academic structures, and this is also related to the question of prestige. The book uh, increasingly is not just a record of research, but is a sort of statement of intent, um, is a, a, a statement that's necessary for, for the academic job market, for tenure committees, if you're thinking about um, the US model um, or the North American model. Um, it's also about integrating um, open access, digital first, if you like, 
with structures like university libraries. One of the things we suddenly realised about six months after publishing our first book was that it wasn't in the UL, it wasn't in the British Library, it wasn't in um, the National Library of Scotland because it wasn't caught up in the same um, framework of deposit um, that a traditional print first book would have been. So, of course, we took steps to, to make that happen. We all ordered it for the university library. We, we sent copies to the British Library uh, and all the other deposit libraries. But that's, again, just one place where um, new frameworks of digital publishing and open publishing, open access publishing, uh, can be slightly and unexpectedly uh, in very small ways sometimes at odds with what we've come to expect uh, as publishers of books. Um, so those are a few of the challenges. I, th I think they're not insuperable. We found it really interesting. I'll talk a little bit about how we actually got to the process, through the process of open access. Once we decided that what we wanted, we had a, a, a list of requirements. One was that we wanted such a thing as a print book. Um, we wanted, we knew that we wanted to have the capacity to say, here's an object, and, and the first of our printed books is going around, as well as the, f the, the, um, the freedom in both senses of uh, a free online copy that everyone could download from any computer um, as long as they have a PDF reader. Um, so we knew that we wanted a printed book, we knew that we wanted a free version in some way. Uh, and we spoke to a number of different publishers. We spoke to uh, Open Book. Uh, we spoke to, um, I can't even remember all the ones that we spoke to, but we, we, we spoke to several, um, both uh, print first and digital first publishers. Uh, all of them had something to offer. All of them were, um, had advantages in some directions and drawbacks in others. All of them uh, were investigating specific kinds of tools. Um, when we spoke to, to open book publishers, they had a, a terrific system for, um, for uh, dynamic texts that would be transformed online, which would have been particularly useful in terms of, uh, uh, of manuscript work or editorial work. It wasn't the route that we were looking to go down. Eventually, we found a good fit with Open Humanities Press because um, we felt they were working in a similar direction to us. Um, in having one foot in digital and one foot in print, which I think in some ways makes the, the transition easier. And th to some extent in the future it might seem like um, the, the print books that we're producing are a kind of Trojan horse smuggling um, the idea of open access into a traditional academic framework. And, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But for us it was important to have both of those things. Um, after we'd done that and we had an agreement in principle that they were interested in um, producing our series, we spoke to a number of um, potential members of our editorial board, uh, brought them on side. We had to submit a series proposal to Open Humanities Press. Uh, it took them uh, not long, I think, a, a, a month or a couple of months um, to look that over, to look over our material uh, and to agree that we could go ahead and prepare a first volume. Uh, the first volume which is going around was the product of a conference that we held at the University of New South Wales in Sydney uh, in the winter of 2014. Um, uh, after that we, we assembled conference proceedings or we asked people to revise their papers for publication. It was a good way I think of putting a kind of stamp on the series because it opened with a bit of diversity um, and there's an introduction that frames the nature of the series. The series itself, I should probably say, Technographies is about um, the, liter the entanglements between writing and technology over the long uh, course of, of history from, well, uh, at the moment the oldest uh, place we're venturing to is 17th century Spain. The next book that's coming out with us uh, is by a, a young researcher from Stockholm called Adam, Adam Vickberg Manson, who's uh, writing or has written a book on the Spanish poet, Golden Age poet Gongora uh, and the media technologies of the time. So we're dealing with entanglements between writing, media, technology and the way in which technology itself has been shaped through writing. So for us also there was a kind of convergence between content, uh, the content of that and, and what we were looking to do as a series, a series that was looking to use new technological means to disseminate findings about the history of technology. 
Um, so after we'd uh, run the conference, gathered in some papers, that then went through an editorial process uh, and it was published. Uh, the conference was uh, December 2014 and the book, I think, was published uh, April or May 2016, which I think for our first volume, trying to get all that together with a very small editorial team, I think we did okay. Uh, there are, again, coming back to drawbacks and teething troubles, uh, as the book goes around, you probably see that some of the type <coughs> is not ideal. Some of it is, it's all readable, but some of it's a little bit faded. Um, that was something that we went back to Open Humanities Press and discussed with them. And for the second book, Steve Connor's Dream Machines, which came out um, earlier this year, uh, uh, the typesetting has been much improved. It's really fantastic. So for us, it's been really, it's been really good to be able to negotiate or at least speak directly to to publisher to the publisher, um, so that if any issues have come up with typesetting, we can fix that for the next round. Um, doesn't completely destroy uh, the edition. Um, and then we went about creating a series identity. The um, the books themselves both have uh, they are different. They're <laughs> it's a kind of spot the difference puzzle. Um, we had we engaged an artist that one of our editors had worked with before in a number of projects to produce um, some striking covers for the series, which gives it a kind of visual identity, um, unites it as a series, and she's agreed to, to produce some more as the, the series goes on. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll probably kind of set in some kind of, ba uh, some sort of archive of these to use as we move forward. Um, this is just a kind of list of the, the practicalities of getting from, uh, from a manuscript to a book. First of all, we ask that, that um, potential contributors send us, uh, we get a lot of inquiries and we always write back saying, you send us a sample, uh, which is usually the book introduction, framing the project, and a sample chapter. We'll give that a pre preliminary reading just to get a sense of whether it's right for the series. If we know about it, we might give it a slightly more in-depth reading if it's a subject uh, that's within one of our areas of expertise, which is mostly um, English literature. Um, if so, if we like it, we'll then send it out to peer review, either with one of our editorial board, if appropriate, uh, or with another suitable um, colleague uh, that we find. Um, we will then, um, if, it's a, if it's a yes, we will move to uh, getting uh, agreement from Open Humanities Press, which is a fairly straightforward process, and then the contract is signed with them. Um, so far, all of, uh, some, to some extent, the, the nature of the contract is up to the author, but so far all of our books have been published with a Creative Commons contract, which is to say it can be freely distributed, um, freely reproduced, um, provided that I think the, the precise nature of that Creative Commons contract is that uh, it has to be attributed to the author. Um, so the contract is signed with OHP, but again, it's a Creative Commons license, so it's fully, um, fully free to distribute. Um, the MS is submitted. It goes through the editorial and proofing stages and then goes um, as a, a Word document to uh, OHP, who typeset it uh, according to the style that we've laid down for the series. And it goes to PDF and print on demand. So the PDF... Uh, I don't think I can actually click a hyperlink in this, but if you go to uh, openhumanitiespress.org... It's um, hard to read. <laughs> it's, yeah, no, it's, it's because it's, uh, it's been clicked. Um, but openhumanitiespress.org, our series title is Technographies. The two books that are currently there are Writing Medium Machine, Modern Technographies, edited by Sean Pryor and David Trotter, uh, and the other Dream Machines, um, uh, a latest book by... Professor Stephen Connor, um, and you can you can just go onto the website and each of those books there's a PDF link and you can download that file direct to your desktop, and there's also a link if you want to buy a copy for yourself, for your library, for your Christmas stockings of your <coughs> friends, and so on. Um, and again, don't forget deposit libraries if you go down this route, and that's a kind of hint at a broader point, which is about um, uh, how these new procedures and processes of open access publishing that we're beginning to put in place, beginning to get the hang of, um, 
do or don't integrate well with the structures of academic publishing that, we've all, that we're all used to using. And so sometimes those come from slightly unexpected places. But it's been really fascinating for me working on this project over the last couple of years. Um, and I would encourage you all, whether it's with Open Humanities Press or another open access publisher that suits the nature of your project, um, to think seriously about going down that route. Because the, the question of prestige, the question of a kind of critical mass will only happen um, when early career researchers as well as established ones feel comfortable you know, committing their words to, to publishing in this format. So I'll, I'll leave it there and, um, and ask if there are any questions. Hey. How are you funded? We're not. We're, we're not funded. Um, Open Humanities Press, um, I believe, has ha had some funding from uh, the universities of the academics who set it up. Um, uh, our series itself is, is not funded at all. Um, the, as far as I'm aware, and I, I, I'm, I'm not part of the central board of, of OHP, as far as I'm aware, all the money, it's a non-profit, all the money that comes into it goes into if you pay your 12 pounds for print on demand in a book that goes to print on demand it doesn't go to open humanities press um, so it's a non-profit it's being funded through um, through university funds um, as far as we're concerned technographies is a project that we do on our own academic time none of us are salaried none of us are paid anything for it um, we occasionally for conferences for instance that we organize those are paid for through our usual you know, academic expenses uh, or through applying to people like, um, well, it was the Modernism Centre at the University of New South Wales in Sydney or places like Crash here, research centres. So. Okay. No, because no, the, the production costs are extraordinary, are, are nothing, you know, because we, we, we do the proofing, we do the editing, takes that bit takes perhaps a little bit uh, longer than than a, an ordinary publisher although I suspect it may not because um, if we have we're working on one book at a time so although um, uh, although we're a smaller team than a traditional publisher uh, our focus is on one book at a time really so we're not being spread out um, we pay nothing to open humanities press authors pay nothing to us it's completely demonetized in that sense. Um, and the only question, the only place that money comes in is if you want a print copy, you pay your £10 or $12 for print on, de print on demand, and that's the print on demand fee. Yes? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think Open Humanities Press does, but I haven't <laughs> seen it, so I can't tell you right now. Yes, although I don't know how you would add the two together. That's a kind of, that's a question. I mean, I have copies of the books, but I find myself downloading the thing all the time because my copies of the books are at home on a library <laughs> shelf somewhere. Um, but I, 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 honest, I honestly don't, don't know. Um, I, I, I know they do keep um, records of the number of page views and clicks and downloads. Um, I don't know whether that enables them to see the number of individual downloads, you know, individual paper, people downloading the, the, the volume. Um, but uh, it would be, yeah, it would be interesting to see. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, great. I'm just an editor. I don't know that side of things. <laughs> oh, right, sure. Okay. Okay, thanks very much.